there are some people who just seem unable to break out of a dogmatic literalism and they relegate the poetic to somehow I don't know it's a, it's a derelict subspecies of true speech or of genuine speech or of what we ought to recognize as appropriate modes of talking about things the the appropriation of genre of utterance as if someone gets to claim what the appropriate genre of utterance is for talking about the sacred. See, I mean, there's a sense in which, why even bring a scientific worldview? I mean, you're not going to get out the Geiger meter and pick up the dee 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 oh, look, sacredness is there. I don't. Th I think you have to move toward the poetic. You do have to move toward the figurative. You have to get out of certain binaries that have cropped up, like the literal and the figurative, like uh, I guess the the divine and the mundane or the secular. I'm going to here try to turn to this is Calvin Schrag's book and. It's hard for me to do this because I feel like it's going to be all out of context and his work is very much, it's a difficult philosophical text. It doesn't read well. And it's going to be highfalutin and it's going to sound like I'm coughing out, you know, $10 words, uh, 30 of them per sentence. But part of the point is that for Schrag, and this, again, it's called God is Otherwise Than Being Toward a Semantics of the Gift, and it is an engagement, you know, with Derrida and Derrida's work on the gift, the gift of death, if you're familiar with that book by Derrida, or it, this is a book's, uh, Derrida's book called Given Time, where he's engaging Moss, and Moss's sort of classic treatment on the gift, right, where, where the gift is dealt with in terms of exchange. See, the more that we think about gift as exchange, we miss the meaning of the gift, Right. See, this is why it's so crucial for Schrag in this book to get at the unrepayability of the gift. See, I think, and, and again, these people who say, well, there's no giver, there's no intentionality, I, I, I don't even know what to say. This person, those people who want to claim that, they should be really glad that there aren't other people who are busybodies. Like if I was some busybody who were going to run around and pull out the are you being literal or are you being figurative stick, I think they'd be exhausted because your language is always going to be peppered with metaphorical, allegorical terms that they're the best that we can do to try to talk about issues at this level of complexity or this level of, of abstraction. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, tables and chairs and uh, things like that, uh, things of the everyday, everyday world. Um, and they're not even scientific. We're not talking about things that, that can be measured on you know, by scales, you know, mathematically, or things like that. But let me just say, I want to say some things here about this book. I think, you know, part of the way to look at the engagement that's going on here is that for Schrag, again, the gift is a kind of unrepayability. It, it offers a, I guess it, it offers a radical... Uh, no expectation of return. See, the more that we think of a gift, you know, he, he compares it with a gift as a present. And we think of, you know, the exchanging of gifts and the exchanging of presents as if one gets caught into an econ uh, sort of economy of exchange between it. And he's, he's sort of picking on Derrida a little bit here. Uh, and this is he's picking on Derrida's uh, given time. And he says, Derrida's principal point is that the insertion of the gift giving into a network of exchange relations results in a virtual negation of the gift as a gift. Within any economy of exchange relations, a gift inevitably incurs indebtedness, even if only in the guise of the customary practice of thanking someone for the gift. In thanking someone for a gift, we are acknowledging we're acknowledging a deed that has been done for us, and in this acknowledgement, we are already giving something back. A genuine gift, in its purity of being freely given without any expectation of return, would need to be forgotten the very moment that it is given and received. It cannot be acknowledged as a gift by either party. 
I mean, that's the killer line. It cannot be acknowledged as a gift by either party, but all this congeals into an aporia of gift giving and gift receiving as an impossibility. The moment the gift is given, it succumbs to an interplay of exchange relations. Strictly speaking, a gift can neither be given nor can it be received. Such is the account given by Derrida, placing us in a bit of a quandary as to how one might accept the account. Uh, that's a paragraph that occurs on page 107. You know, I think that people who are familiar with the debate that was sort of going on there and what, what Derrida is doing in an eternal deferment that makes the gift impossible. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that when I give the gift and the other takes the gift, the gift is unacknowledged by both parties and to some extent can't even be a gift in order to be a gift, leaves us without a very accurate history of what did transpire for the human. I think what it fails to do, and this is part of Schrag's point, right, or, and I'm not going to say it's Schrag's point, this is part of the point I'm trying to make with Schrag's text, that there seems to be in human psychology a recognition of the gift character. Now, I've heard people say, hey, look, the only people, in response to me, I've heard people say, the only thing that you need to do is to repay your parents. They're the ones who've done things for you. You know what? I think many parents say, don't give back to me, give to your kids. I think the parents who have kids because they want those kids to pay them back, that is not the gift. That is not a gift of a life. That is an exchange, and it's a commodified exchange of humanity. I guess I don't know how to speak about the gift of life. I don't think you need a giver for life to be a gift. I don't think it needs to be intentional for it to be a gift. What's fascinating is an organism who evolutionarily became possible and somehow necessary to hide from that fact <laughs> or to deal with it. Religion. All the dog, and so much of this is attacking the idolatry. I mean, he's got all these wonderful things from Kierkegaard on his attack on Christendom and on Nietzsche and on how important it is to see the ridiculous idolatry that religion is in separating off the, the sacred event of this gift from all the bells and the, the bowing and the, the holy waters and the, all the things. I mean, the, the sacraments have come to mean something other than metaphorical reminders of the mystery. They've become these literal things that people are, are goofed up and taking all too literally. I don't know how to, how to get at this issue of, of what it means to say that life is a gift. I don't think that you need a giver. I think what you need is to recognize that the human for whatever reason, feels the, the indebtedness to many generations. I mean, it's not just your parents, because your parents had parents, and those parents had parents, and the language that all of them learned that gave bloom into the self-aware individuals who were thinking about these issues, it, it surpasses many, many, many generations. It's a love beyond many generations. And it can't be separated from all that is. I mean, a language that grows in a vacuum is no language at all. Even a language that we would give to a computer, it would be us giving it to a computer and us as the product of natural evolution and, and all of that as a product of inorganic developments over millennia. And so it's really hard to, I guess, talk about the gift. I think if you say that the gift is a gift beyond repayment, I think it's funny how many people were really irritated with that. The irritation that people have with that, I think, is, is interesting. Now, they could be irritated because they just think it's stupid. Well, then, fine. You know, uh, Another part of me is watch that in your own mind and try to see if you can see what that is. Is it just irritation or is there something about... I mean, is that why religion happens? Does religion happen as people try to get out of this displaced guilt from the felt sense of the gift character? You know? Is that why the dogma happens? Uh, the religious dogma. I mean, do people succumb to religious dogma 
in an attempt to manage this recognition of life as a gift. 